Welcome to Hack the Entrepreneur, the show which reveals the fears, habits, and inner battles behind big name entrepreneurs and those on their way to joining them. Now here is your host, John Naster. Hey, hey, this is Hack the Entrepreneur. Thank you so much for joining me again today. I am your host, John Naster, but you can call me Johnny. My guest today is a marketer, designer, and entrepreneur. In 2008, while employed as an e-commerce marketing manager at Camping World, my guest began building websites and tools for graphic designers on the side. What began as a side hustle with BrushEasy.com, my guest spent the past 11 years building and growing the Full Easy brand, which now includes four main products built in-house with their 18-person team and several other companies that they have acquired along the way. In this episode, we discuss success as a sliding scale using search engine optimization to get customers, and how to choose your next project. Now, let's hack Sean Rebel. I want to take a moment to thank today's sponsor, ActiveCampaign. ActiveCampaign enables you to send perfectly timed messages in response to your customers' actions and behaviors. It's been proven. Companies using marketing automation see 53% higher conversions than those using traditional, what I call boring, email marketing methods. Treat your contacts as unique individuals rather than sending everyone the same boring message. With marketing automation, your campaigns can listen, learn, adapt, and respond, all based on your contacts' behaviors and as their customer profile changes. It's beautiful, it's easy to use, and you don't need to hire consultants because you can set it up for yourself. See why thousands are upgrading to a more intelligent marketing solution. Sign up for a free 14-day trial right now. No credit card needed. Go to activecampaign.com slash hack. There's no training fees. There's absolutely no contracts and pricing is accessible to any business. Plus, there's an absolutely special offer for Hack the Entrepreneur listeners. You can get a free migration service right now. Move all your contacts, lists, templates, anything you want from your old provider. You're going to get your second month of service absolutely for free, no matter what pricing level you decide to take. Plus, there's a free one-on-one strategy session with a platform consultant. You can use this during your free trial to give yourself a jump start. Start marketing smarter today. Get and convert more leads with ActiveCampaign. Go to activecampaign.com slash hack right now. We are back with another episode of Hack the Entrepreneur, and today we have a very, very special former Canadian moved down to Kentucky guest. That's right. Sean, welcome to the show. Thank you. Glad to be here. Absolutely. My pleasure. And I think we're going to have a lot of fun. Yes. Let's do it. Yeah, let's jump into it. Sean, as an entrepreneur, can you tell me what is the one thing that you do that you feel has been the biggest contributor to your successes so far? The one thing, huh? Mm -hmm. (laughs) Contributor to my success. Well, I guess when I think about that, you know, I question what success is, right? Like success is a sliding scale. You know, everyone measures it differently. Some people measure it with time or, you know, happiness or some other metric. So I guess if I would consider myself successful, if I've been able to kind of play this game by my own rules, I've been able to you know, start this company and do it on my own terms. We bootstrapped it. So I get to kind of call the shots and be the boss, so to speak. But, you know, the, the one metric, if I had to look back on that and, and figure out, you know, what's really got me to where I am right, right now would be the, just the idea of getting, finding the right people, getting the right help and getting the right people on the bus. And I say that because for years I, I managed to go from, you know, the corporate world to step out on my own and kind of be this hobbyist. I went from being this entrepreneur to this guy who got out of the rat race and started kind of doing my own thing. But I made a lot of mistakes during those times. I focused on the wrong things and just because it was all me, well, you know, I had a lot of losses and looking back on those losses, I see that, you know, I made those wrong, I made some wrong decisions. 
went down a path that I probably shouldn't have gone down, focused on something that I probably shouldn't have focused on. When all the while I had these other projects that were still continuing to be successful, but I wasn't spending any time on them. I just thought that was kind of this, this normal thing when really looking back at it, I should have dedicated a hundred percent of my focus and a hundred percent of my time to those projects. So as I doubled down and had the opportunity to refocus, I found the right help. I ended up hiring a COO who has been one of my good friends for a long time. He's probably one of the smartest guys I know. And then we hired a CTO who came from this kind of mutual friend connection. And we have turned out to be really good friends. So they're two literally the smartest guys I know. And we've been able to continue to scale up and build a business that has gone from, you know, my little hobby project to this, this larger company. We're at 18 employees now and we'll have 20 here pretty soon. Wow. And uh, we're continuing to grow. So it's been a lot of fun, but you know, there's, I couldn't have done it without those guys. So it's, you know, if I look back at the one thing, it's just getting the right people on the bus and, you know, getting incentives aligned. Nice. I love it. And so 11 years since the inception of this, at what point did you start getting hiring teammates? Oh, maybe four years ago. Wow. So, so you so, went at it yourself for seven years. Yeah. And I did it through just, you know, hiring freelancers and contractors. And it was an interesting story. I started out, you know, I'm not a coder. Uh, my background's in design. So I would hire uh, programmers to, you know, build these little websites, these crazy little ideas I had. And it would go great. But the problem was that incentives weren't aligned. So, you know, these, these freelancers, they literally just wanted to get to the next job to get paid. They would want to complete their task and get it done in a timely manner that I found acceptable so they could get their paycheck. And at the end of the day, they weren't really looking out for the greater good of the business. And as I continued to, you know, keep working with them, I just kind of realized that, wait a minute, we're, things aren't moving in the right direction here. You know, we're slapping changes upon changes and junk upon junk. And it just kind of turned into this, this cluster that was very difficult to manage and operate. So we ended up bringing in a CTO and he really kind of fixed things from the ground up and allowed us to scale and get a lot bigger. So. Yeah, that was probably four years ago now, uh, three years ago, actually. And since then, we've really just been on this crazy growth path now. So it's been a lot of fun. And so at this point, so it's under the easy brand, right? That's correct. Yes. But there's multiple sites or businesses even, you could say, individually under this? Yeah. So we've been building websites under the easy brand. We actually have plans to branch out from that. There's a few other things that we want to get into that don't necessarily make sense under the easy brand per se, like it just kind of, it's got a fun, cheesy name to it, if you will. But we want to focus on some more high level projects that are don't necessarily doesn't roll off the tongue with the easy brand, let's say. So, uh, so yeah, we, and then we actually ended up acquiring a whole bunch of more sites through, you know, when I hired our COO, one of the things we did was we borrowed money from friends and family and started acquiring up some of these smaller websites that were essentially kind of competing with us for space. So we were, had the opportunity to kind of build up this little moat around our business, which was nice as well. Wow. So, so you went out and bought, bought up competitors. Yeah. So we probably, you know, looking back on it now, I think it was probably around $2 million we borrowed and, you know, bought up some of these smaller competitors and, you know, continue to operate them and manage them. And then we, you know, paid, paid it all back to friends and family with it, including interest. So it was, it was a great little, little opportunity for everybody. So it was a lot of fun. Interesting. And so, but those don't directly fall under the easy brand. Like, did you keep those, you kept the companies running? Yeah. So, you know, each, each site had its own little brand. So we just operate them separately. We never, we never bothered to like roll them in to the brand. So it's just something that we've continued to work on and we kind of fly under the radar a little bit with them. We don't really promote them in any way, but it was a, it was a good little investment from a personal investment standpoint and really helped you know, solidify our positioning in the market. So it was a lot of fun. How many of those did you buy up? Oh, six, six and then you have, I would say. Do you have four main brands under Easy? Yes, that's correct. So we were oh, operating about 10 people. websites right now. Yes, that's right. We'd like to, we're continuing to scale up. So we still have a lot of work to do and a lot more people to hire. But, you know, being in Kentucky, we're not exactly in a, a tech hub. So finding good talent is especially hard to come by. So that's why we're remote. We have a lot of our senior engineers remote uh, that work for us. And then, you know, if we, we find talent in town, we obviously try to 
to hire them. And we've been doing a lot of meetups and things like that to bring people into our office and get to know us better. You know, for years, I just operated this business out of my house. No one knew who I was. I still come across people locally here in Bowling Green, Kentucky that say, oh, I, I used your site every day years ago. I had no idea that you were in Bowling Green. So <laughs> we're, yeah, we're starting to kind of put a stake in the ground and let people know that we're here. You know, we're looking for, for good help. And we've been fortunate enough to have a lot of talented people come to us, which is nice. So you're staying like that's, you're not using it as sort of something that's holding you back. You're going to kind of stake your ground and that's where you're staying and bring people to you as you grow. Yeah. I mean, I moved to Bowling Green 13 years ago for a job and ended up meeting my wife. We had some kids, we built a house and, you know, I have no intention of leaving now. You know, our, our kids have lives here. Our kids have friends. We've, we've put down roots. We've made the decision to put down some roots here. So, you know, we're happy to be part of the community and we just want to continue to, to grow it and be a part of it any way we can. Wow. Excellent. So with the, like, how has the company changed from besides growing a team, but like those first, what, six or seven years of you growing it yourself, was it literally just, you would come up with an idea, start a site, and then you just started a bunch of them and eventually folded them under a brand? Because I know like looking at it now, people are going to go to the site. They're going to be like, wow, like this, like it's, it's a big thing, right? So sure. they're, they, if we could kind of go back and see how you sort of formed it into this, it would be interesting to see. Sure. So I, you know, when I first moved to Bowling Green, I was working as just a web designer here in town and ended up taking a completely unrelated job in marketing. And I was at the time I was kind of scared to death. I didn't know a thing about marketing. I went from dealing with shape and color and negative space to suddenly looking at numbers and spreadsheets all day. So I, at night I would go home and I, I needed some sort of creative outlet. So I would again, go back to what I knew how to do. And that was just kind of design websites. So I kind of got the, the entrepreneurial bug a little bit to create my own website. And this is way back in the day. Now dig.com was kind of like the, the hot site at the time. And I was like, man, I want a site like dig, but I, I was not a blogger. I could, I was not good at writing. So I thought I want some sort of content that users can submit. And then I thought, well, I want something design related. And I just kind of stumbled upon the fact that there were all these Photoshop brushes out there that did not have, you know, home. There was a lot of designers sharing them on their blogs. So I just send them an email and be like, Hey, we'd love to quote feature these on our site. And everyone would say, sure, sure. Love to do that. So we would just continue to collect Photoshop brushes and put them on the site. And then it, before I knew it, you know, the site just kind of took off. So I definitely got lucky. I come kind of stumbled into an area where an area in the market where there was a need that was unfulfilled and uh, it kind of took off like a rocket. So, uh, and I thought that th that was totally normal. <laughs> I thought that, oh, you just build a website and thousands of people start coming to it every day. So uh, it, it took me a while to realize that, no, this is, that's not something normal that people do. I'm just building a website. It does not mean people will visit it. So yeah, I would just continue to operate that. And then before I knew it, I was making enough money that I could kind of quit my day job and get it on my own. But the idea was literally just a creative outlet. Yes, yes, definitely. You know, of course I wanted to, the entrepreneur in me wanted to make some money. So it was like, Hey, I wonder if I can just like make 50 bucks a month. And then it was like, Hey, I wonder if I can pay my mortgage on this thing. And then it was like, I wonder if I can actually make a living from doing this. And it was just baby steps all along the way until before I knew it, I was, I was out the door and, and kind of doing my own thing. I love it. I love it. So back at the beginning, Sean, you said it was finding the right people and getting those right people around you. That was your one thing. Sure. Now every business expert out there talks about that 80, 20 rule in business, mm -hmm. uh, where you find that 20% that gets you the 80% of results, do what you're good at and delegate the rest. Mm -hmm. Sean, can you tell me something that you're absolutely not good at in your business? Oh, I could, we could talk for hours about all the things I'm not good at. So obviously I wasn't a programmer, so I knew that I needed, you know, good help in someone who could manage another team of programmers and continue to scale this tech company. I was not a tech minded guy, but I was building this tech company. And I could see that was a problem. So, you know, we got, got our uh, CTO on the bus. His name's Adam and he's been unbelievable. And so he handles a lot of the tech things involved with the business. I am not good at one other thing I'm not good at when it comes to business is finance. So my other business partner, Richard is the COO and he is 
a financial genius. So he can run numbers in his sleep. And so just bringing him on board, we're dealing with a lot of data, a lot of numbers and having somebody that talented to be able to, you know, slap together a spreadsheet, sort through all the numbers and spit out answers in the direction that we need to go is uh, super valuable. So just those two skills alone have been, you know, very essential to building our business and getting us to where we are right now. From the very beginning, you knew you were no good at tech. Like you couldn't build the sites yourself. So you sure. hired it out. And so that just kind of like came all the way through this past, I guess, 11 years. But mm-hmm. was it with finance? Was it something maybe like, did you hold on to it a little bit too long before delegating that out? Or was that something you also got rid of as soon as possible? Yeah, no, it was, it was certainly something that, you know, I would try to do myself. Now, Richard was a close friend of mine even before we started doing business together. So he would help me and I would always bring questions to him like, Hey, I've got this problem or I'm, I'm thinking about this situation. What do you think about this? You know, we would always bounce ideas off each other. And that's how we started actually working together because I brought problem to him and said, Hey, I've got this problem. And you know, solving the problem was potentially a lot of money. And he helped me figure out how to solve it. And we essentially formed a partnership there and started to go into business together, which has since then rolled into our, our current business. So yeah, the finance, the financial piece was something I was not good at. And just being able to go to him and approach him and bounce those ideas off him was, was super valuable. And asking for help. Is, Absolutely. Like, is this something you still do to this day? Like with either coaches or mentors or? Oh, I, I don't trust myself to make any decisions. <laughs> <laughs> of course I make plenty of decisions, you know, on a day to day basis, but when it comes to like the big rocks of like, Hey, this is a path we are thinking about going down. Um, or I think we need to go down this. I am scared to death to make that decision myself. Now I want to get as many smart people involved as possible. Think about all the scenarios and at the end of the day, make the decision to, to move forward. So having smart people, you know, on the bus is again, I think part of the reason why we've been successful so far. Okay. This leads us perfectly into projects. Sure. And so projects as a loose term. So whether it's a new company you wanted to buy up or whether it's a new product that you want to put out the door or a new marketing venture you want to take on, whatever that happens to be, you can make the decision. But right now with people of a team of 18 and growing, you in charge, but also having smart people around you. When an idea comes to you or is brought to you during meetings, I'm not sure how this works, but I would love to know sort of the process, whether it's a written process you guys use or just like an internal gut process that you go off of. What's the process for you at this point, deciding that a project is worth yours and your team's time, energy, and resources? Oh, that's a good question. So if you had have asked me this question six years ago, I probably would have just not even thought about it and started working on it. <laughs> that, that is a huge, it was a huge problem with myself. You know, entrepreneurs, you just go after the next shiny thing and the next thing that you can make a lot of money at without necessarily proving that it's the correct path to go down. And I made that mistake several times and learned from that. So I've now at the point in my career where I do have the luxury of still remembering the pain of the mistakes that I made previously. And it's still a constant reminder, but it also started this whole thing. That's just true. Going that's after true. It. <laughs> yeah. So there's that delicate balance there, but now I think I'm a lot more focused than I used to be. We, we see an opportunity in front of us. We see an end game in front of us. So we continue to work towards that. So it ha- at this point it has to be something pretty powerful for us to deviate from it. So when I look at something new that pops up on our radar, you know, you start looking at, you start running numbers in your head. Uh, how much time do we think we can accomplish this goal? What would that goal or reward look like if we accomplished it? How much, you know, resources will it take? And then you can kind of back out and make a decision from there. If you can't see the end game, then you probably shouldn't begin it. That's just kind of something that I think about. So yeah, I think it just starts with looking at the end game and trying to back out and make decisions and, and go from there. Nice. So how much time, what's the reward and what are the resources it would take to implement? Absolutely. When you talk about end game and knowing your end game, do you guys like, what is the end game at this point with your team and easy? You know, I don't know yet. We see still so much opportunity in front of us that we haven't thought about it too much. Of course, every you know entrepreneur would love some giant exit. I don't know if that's on the table for us. I don't know if there's a company out there that would want to acquire us. I'm, I'm sure there is. 
But if there isn't, you know, we're not out there asking people. We're just got our heads down and we keep working. Certainly, I think that an acquisition could make sense at some point. But yeah, right now we're just having a lot of fun continuing to build stuff. I think myself at the core, I'm a builder. So I love to build things and plan things. And that's what I enjoy the most. So the end game is, is a ways off right now. I th- we see so much opportunity in front of us to continue to just keep building things that can continue to make money and grow the business. Okay. So then when, when you're talking about a new project and you're talking about end game, you're talking about that reward. Sure. Is it like, is that what you mean? Like, is that reward big enough to make it worth the time, the resources and the potential fact that it might not work out? Sure. So, I mean, the reward clearly is, is monetary. I think there's other rewards, of course, but I think when it comes to business, we're looking at the financial reward, you know, does this make sense for us financially to go down this path? Can we dive into this new market that we're totally uneducated on and be successful in the form of building a profitable business within that little space on the internet? Those are all the things that we discuss. So if we think that we can't build something profitable, you know, then we start to really ask ourselves questions of why are we doing this? Because <laughs> at the end of the day, we're, we're in business to turn a profit. So, Right. And then if it was acquiring another competitor, then it would be still the reward, but also taking into account possible, I guess, conflicts or what they, well, the competition, <laughs> the fact Absolutely, that you'll know. Yeah. 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 So it, it all depends, you know, what the path is. If it's an acquisition, it's looking at you know, what will this do for us? How will, how will this position us as a company? Do we take, are we taking them out of the market or are we partnering with them at some level? Does this, you know, there's a million reasons why companies buy other companies. Sometimes it looks like a crazy reason on the front of the deal, but on the back end, it's some sort of tax game. So there's a lot of crazy reasons why acquisitions happen. So we just, you know, when we went through and bought, did ours, it was really just to, to build a little moat around our business and and position position us in a way that, you know, we could get some traction in the market. Yeah. And then, so now that you have traction and you said like when you first started, you just thought that you could put up a website and thousands of people would come. Right. That's obviously changed over time. Sure. How's like the main way that you guys are acquiring customers at this point? Sure. So we are very heavily focused on SEO. We are just constantly looking at SEO opportunities and making sure that our site's built in a way that Google can crawl and index and continue to, you know, send us traffic. So we don't have, we don't do any paid marketing right now. That's something that could potentially be on the radar in the future. We're still trying to internally get a lot of our, get our ducks in a row, so to speak. So we can then start going after the paid acquisition channels. But yeah, right now we're very focused on SEO and Google and we've got a our team is very well educated in what we can do and what we can't do and, and what we need to do moving forward. So acquisitions of competitors start to make sense. In some Sometimes of those ways. they make sense. We've yeah. looking back on it now, we've acquired some that didn't make sense right. where we thought they made sense at the time, but, but yeah, it's uh, it's an SEO play. So we're getting, you know, 150,000 visitors a day to one of our biggest sites right now. And it's all through Google. And then, you know, we've got this other network of sites that are continuing to get similar numbers and, and bring it in. So, that's impressive. It's a lot of fun. Yes. It's scary. It's scary because a lot of our eggs are in Google's basket. But if you look at a lot of the top companies on the internet, you know, that's just the game we play. That is the game you play. Exactly. And if you've figured it out, then I mean, it, it pays dividends in its way. And hopefully at that same time, you can also figure out the paid channels. And Absolutely. I love it. I love it. All right, Sean, this has been an absolute blast, man. I do want to wrap up on one final question for you, if I can. Sure. Sure. That's, this idea I'm working with calling the entrepreneurial gap. Okay. So as entrepreneurs, as dreamers, it seems like we always are projecting our personal successes into the future. Mm-hmm. Meaning in three months when you hit that revenue goal or in six months when you get your 25th team member, whatever it happens to be, that's when you'll see yourself as successful. Yet you and I both know, Sean, that seconds before you hit that, you're going to set five bigger, loftier goals into the future. <laughs> sure. Which I, I agree we have to, but it's like walking towards the horizon. The further you walk, the further away it always gets. Right. So I would love it if you could right now, rather than looking forward, if you could stop, turn around and look behind you mm-hmm. this past 11 years, the highs, the lows, the wins and the losses. And tell me how you feel about this whole kind of crazy journey until today. 
I feel great about it. You know, looking at this, I still feel like I'm just getting started. I still feel like I'm at the beginning. But looking back at where I've been, it's it's been a it's been a ride. You know, all the mistakes I've made and learning from those mistakes has been super valuable. I've made some mistakes that could have sunk other people, you know, whether it's spending too much money on a website or or just building building it the wrong way. But being able to learn from that, I think is the most valuable thing and as an entrepreneur, if you can continue to just learn from your mistakes and just do things and learn, you're going to win in the end. I know a lot of people who I like to say they like to play business. So they like to they like to have coffee and meet with people and talk about ideas. But at the end of the day, if you're not doing things uh, and getting things done, you're not really moving forward. So I hope that answers your question. Uh, I feel like I've rambled quite a bit here. but No, man, it totally, totally, totally answers yeah. the question. It's yeah. great. So we've got to talk about the business in passing. Sure. Could you now tell the listeners specifically where to track it down and also just kind of give them the elevator pitch, as we call it? Sure. So easy.com, double E-Z-Y.com or double E-Z-Y if you're in Canada. That's our co- corporate site. That's where you can find our four main sites. We have free and pre- premium graphics for designers, for Photoshop brushes and vector graphics and free WordPress themes and templates and a lot of stock video. So yeah, we build sites and try to help other designers finish their projects quicker and make them look prettier. Very cool. So it's easy.com is the main corporate site, which breaks down sort of to four sites, which is Brush Easy, Themezy, Themezy, Themezy. Themezy, yes. Themes, been there a lot we of go, Themezy, VectEasy yeah. and VidEasy. That's correct, yep, good job. I'll link to all those on hacktheentrepreneur.com for you when you're done and you're ready to check them out. Otherwise, just remember eezy.com as a Canadian. Sean, once again, thank you so much for stopping by. Thank you so much for sharing so openly. I really do appreciate it. And please, man, just keep doing what you're doing because it's awesome to watch. Sounds good, John. Thanks for having me. Email, email, email. Get people onto your list. Collect emails from the beginning. How many times have you heard this? Email, email is one of the most, if not the most effective form of marketing available to us as digital entrepreneurs. But the boring, old, standard, basic email marketing that isn't targeted and isn't personalized is kind of pointless. It's been proven companies using marketing automation will see a 53% higher conversion than those using traditional email marketing. Sign up right now for free for 14-day trial. No credit card needed. Go to activecampaign.com slash hack. There's no contracts. There's no training fees. Collect those emails. Yes. Build the email list. Yes. But more importantly, start marketing smarter today with ActiveCampaign. Go to activecampaign.com slash hack and get your 14-day free trial right now. Well, that was a lot of fun. I really enjoyed that. Sean was introduced to me through a friend and I didn't know anything really about easy.com and sort of the full business that he's built there. When I started doing the research, it was fascinating. And I'm so glad that I got to have Sean on the show to kind of dig into how he created that as a side hustle, which is brilliant. I love it. Started on the side, just putting out some sites and then one kind of takes off and then built a full company around it that's growing at a great rate. So It was a really cool conversation. It was a conversation that I really, really enjoyed taking part in. And now we've reached the point in the show that I enjoy sometimes even more, actually, when I get to go back and I get to listen to the conversation the way you get to listen to it. So I went back and listened to the conversation with Sean, and then I went back and I listened to the conversation again. That second time back through the conversation, there was something Sean had said that I had missed. It it slipped by me. I'm not sure how, but when I went back and I heard it, it was so very, very clear to me. Microsoft that when they were launching the MSN Music Store Sean and they wanted said. to add lyric functionality into it. it. They found our old did website, which had no Let's lyrics do. on it, Let's but did have my cell phone number. And they called me, and this is very metaphorical to how everything evolved after this call, but they called me literally while I was stepping onto a roller coaster at Canada's Wonderland with my family. And it was the summer after I had graduated from university. And thus began the roller coaster ride of entrepreneurship. And that's the hack. Sean, 
Sean, Sean. I love this. I love this part of your story. And I love that this is part of so many people's story. The idea, I mean, it's 11 years ago that you decided that entrepreneur and you wanted to make some money and you thought, I wonder if I could make $50 a month, which it, it's, so I, I shouldn't, I was going to say that, which seems insignificant, but I know that it's not, it's not to a ton of people. I read an article a few years ago, I forget where it was. And it was, they had asked like a couple thousand people, like what life-changing money was to them. And it was like 250 or $350 or something a month, which really, really shocked me because it's, it's not about these giant, it's not necessarily about going full time always. It is ultimately, but you start with these baby steps, right? So I love this mindset of, let's just see if I can make $50 a month. That's a dollar and like 30 cents or something a day you have to make times 30 days, right? And then it's like, okay, well, let's see now if we step it up and to pay my mortgage. And then beyond that, it's not just like, how can I quit my job and completely start a business from scratch and replace everything I was making. That's super hard to do. That's totally sort of the wrong mindset and the wrong way to think about it. It's these steps, right? And those steps kind of don't stop. You can keep scaling them up like Sean's still doing. I mean, he's building a team around him to, he's acquiring other sites in his market to make more and to grow bigger. That's awesome. But it all started with that making $50 a month. This is where it starts. 11 years into it now, it sounds like he has this big thing around him, but it literally started with him just wanting to make $50. That to me is brilliant. Sean, thank you. I wrote a book. As of today, 9,264 people have bought it. You right now can get it absolutely for free. Well, it's going to cost you an email address. <laughs> Go to hacktheentrepreneur.com right now. Put your email in at the top. You will get a PDF or Kindle version of the book absolutely free. If you would like to purchase a paperback version of the book, you still can. They're on Amazon for, I think, $12.99 or something. But I want to give you my book absolutely free. Head over to hacktheentrepreneur.com. Check out the brand new website. Get your email in there. Get the book. Hit reply to any of those emails. Let me know where you are, where you're listening, what's, what's happening in your world. And then tell me how you dig the book. That'd be cool. All right. It's been fun. Once again, easy.com, brush easy, theme easy, all.coms, and Sean, S H A W N R U B E L. Rubel is on Twitter if you would like to track him down. When you head over to the website, you can find the podcast on there, and Sean's page will be up there with all those links for you then to check out right after you download my book absolutely for free. <laughs> All right. It's been fun. Thank you so much for stopping by. I really, truly do appreciate it. And please, until next time, keep hacking the entrepreneur.